Thanks. So uh, I'm very pleased this week to introduce Peter Moore. So, um, you know, many of us, I mean, all of us use physical constants and so on. Many of us know that behind how that works, there's a lot of hard work figuring out what the values of constants are and how that relates to units and how to make the whole thing self-consistent and rigorous and so on. So there's a whole bunch of international committees and uh, Peter has been on or is still on several of those bodies trying to figure out how to sort out the constants. And after sort of decades of discussion about uh, two or three years ago, they completely revised how the, how the fundamental constants and the SI units are defined. So there's basically nobody better to describe to us how this worked than Peter. So I'm very pleased that he agreed to the invitation to speak to us today. So, uh, so it's all yours, Peter. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. I appreciate it. And I hope uh, I can uh, convey all the information that uh, will be useful, that is needed. So uh, the title is The New SI and Fundamental Constants. Um, and the, uh, oops, that was working a minute ago, okay. Um, and here is the definition of the international system of units. So now you can just put it on one page. And it uh, basically says, that certain constants have certain values. And that defines all the standards of measurement that are in the SI. And that's something which, uh, it's a different way of doing things than has been done in the past. I mean, in the past there was a kilogram, which is a piece of metal. And before that there were wavelengths of light and there were uh, uh, metal meter bars and things of that sort, actual objects. But now it's really just physical constants, which are properties of nature. And uh, that is fairly different than what it was. So here's a list of the constants that you need. There are seven. One is the frequency of cesium, the ground state hyperfine frequency of cesium that defines time. If you know the frequency, you know time. And if you want to click off a second, if it's, uh, it's a microwave, so you can actually count the oscillations and add them up nine billion of them or whatever that nine trillion of them to get yourself a, uh, a second. And uh, then length is defined by the speed of light in vacuum. It, it, it used to be defined uh, how far light would travel in a certain amount of time, but now it's just telling you what the speed of light is. And that automatically takes care of that because now you know what the second is and you know what the distance that light travels in a certain amount of time is and that gives you a meter. Now the bigger change is the ones circled in blue. The Planck constant is given the value. Previously, the Planck constant was measured and I'll get more detail into more detail about that as, as we go forward. Elementary charge is given a number rather than the current as being defined. It's now the charge. Uh, the Boltzmann constant is given a number and the Boltzmann constant is really just a conversion between energy and temperature scales. So it doesn't really uh, really change much except what the scale is for temperature. And, uh, and this fixes it to be, a certain, uh, to be a certain way. And again, I'll talk about that in more detail. The Avogadro constant is now defined by saying what Avogadro's constant is. Uh, it's a certain number and that's also different. I'll go through these all in detail, what the old is, and what the new is as we go forward. But this is just the summary. And then there's the Loomis efficacy of monochromatic radiation of frequency. This defines the candela, which most people, except if you're in that business, don't really understand, including myself. So that's, but it's there for lightness, for light brightness. So here are the questions to uh, address. Why do units matter? I'll give you some references if you want to look further. Examples of fundamental constants, what, what we're talking about here. Uh, the code, code data, what they do in terms of defining the values, how the most accurate values are determined, uh, why should we change the system, uh, how do the definitions actually work, why do constants give you measurement standards, is that question. And once the definition takes place, how does that affect 
other constants besides the ones that are used as def defining constants. And then a couple of historical comments at the end. So why do units matter? And here is an example that shows why they matter. For example, if you measure the electron mass in solar mass units, not something that everybody would wanna do, but if you do, you get an uncertainty of 4.7 times 10 to the minus five. You'll see often the numbers I put up will have a, uh, a thing on the right that's in square brackets and that's the relative uncertainty. So this is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 61 plus or minus 22. And this is the relative uncertainty. In other words, this divided by the whole number. And so that gives you a good feel for how accurate the number is. Well now the, elect the electron mass in these units is not so good. And that's because the unit is no good. The question is how good is your unit in this case? Another, the next best thing is kilograms. You can measure the electron mass in kilograms and you get an uncertainty, which is, uh, my screen is covered up here. Let me just uncover it. Okay, you get an uncertainty, which is three times 10 to the minus 10, much better than the solar mass case. And then another unit you can use is the relative atomic mass unit. And that's a unit, which is the mass of one twelfth of a carbon atom. In other words, if you take a carbon atom and divide its mass by 12, that's an atomic mass unit. And you can measure the electron mass relative to that better. And it's 2.9 parts and 10 to the 11 currently. Uh, and it's easy to see why it's easier because it's a scale, a carbon atom is more the scale of an electron than the kilogram is. Kilogram is macroscopic and these are both microscopic. So you can make the comparison better between two microscopic things. And of course, if you choose that the electron mass is your mass standard, then you have no uncertainty. And so you can see the range of uncertainties. It does depend on the unit that you choose to measure it in. It's not so much about the electron as about the unit for this example. Here are a couple of websites which you can find out more about this. One is at NIST and one is at the BIPM, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, who define the SI, basically. They write the SI brochure, which tells you what the SI is. And so the, these two websites will uh, provide further information. And here are some publications. And the top one is one for students, actually. It was written by uh, Sandra Knotts, myself, and Bill Phillips, who's at NIST. And it's uh, for aimed at high school students to explain how these new units work because it's not obvious what a list of constants uh, tells you about measuring things. And then there's some other older uh, references just to fill it out more historical. And uh, these would provide additional background information if it's of interest. So what are fundamental constants? What are we calling fundamental constants here? Um, proton charge radius is one. And these are an order of increasing precision or decreasing uncertainty. So the proton charge radius, we know to about 2.2 parts in 10 to the three, which is not great, but it's very <coughs> difficult to measure. Uh, and there was a lot of controversy about that. That's pretty much died down that measuring it one way give you one value and measuring it another way give you another value. But uh, these things are kind of, I'm not gonna go into that in detail. That's not uh, the main interest here, but that's something you can, you can read up on. In fact, we are soon gonna publish the latest adjustment of the constants where all of these things are explained. We're in the proofreading stages right now. Newtonian constant of gravitation. This is a very difficult one to measure. And uh, I think the people doing the experiments like to explain it and they say there's a huge background and the background is the earth, which is pulling on everything that you're trying to measure. And so that makes it difficult to, to measure. And not only that, there are discrepant measurements. People using different methods get different results. And so uh, uh, it's not improved in accuracy uh, from, not much from when it was first measured. Uh, I guess Cavendish was one of the uh, first people. Uh, 
The electron mass in kilograms is another constant uh, that's known to parts in 10 to the 10, which is much better than it was before the new definition of the SI. Fine structure constant, that's of course independent of units. And that's now known at about one and a half parts in 10 to the 10, which is very precise. The Rydberg frequency is known to a couple parts in 10 to the 12. The Planck constant is now exact. And the Avogadro constant is now exact. So here's some typical constants. I just want to give you an idea and the range of uncertainties that they have and uh, all the way up to exact. The business of finding good values for the fundamental constants pretty much started with Raymond Burge. He did this in a very comprehensive way back in 1929, published in the very first article in the Reviews of Modern Physics. So we, to keep up tradition, have been always publishing in the Reviews of Modern Physics, which uh, for no real reason, except that it's uh, well widely read and also uh, traditional place to put the fundamental constants. Burge, and I feel a special spot in my heart to Burge because when I was a graduate student at Berkeley, I sat in Burge Hall, which was uh, named after him uh, in honor of his uh, developing the department there. Now the uh, codata, which is a name you often hear attached to fundamental constants, is uh, that was established in the in the 60s. And the reason one of the reasons was that there were people publishing values of fundamental constants uh, all over the place. I mean, they would every once in a while, there'd be another paper and they come out with different constants. And uh, so it became kind of a uh, disorganized endeavor. And so people got together and said, Look, let's try to do this in a systematic way. So they formed this group called Codata. And uh, in this group, they formed the task group on fundamental constants. And I've been a member of that for some time. I was chair at one time, but uh, it's now gone on to other people. And we, every four years, produce uh, the best recommended values based on all the data that's available and all of the theory that's available. And we try to get the best values of the constants and we publish them. And people pretty much recognize those as being standard because uh, Otherwise it would be, as I said, chaos like it was before. And so every four years we update the information. So it's uh, an attempt to keep up to date on them. They're, they're meant to be current as much as four years can be. So the task group, there's a task group, which is about a dozen people from all different countries. And we meet and together decide how the data should be collected and used and uh, the methods of uh, analyzing it. We basically use a least squares adjustment, simple minded least squares adjust adjustment, nothing fancy, no uh, Bayesian sp statistics or anything like that. We just, we just do a least squares adjustment, uh, I, you would say a la Gauss, and uh, those, that provides us with the best values for the constants. In other words, it's the best fit for the constants and the data and the theory, the best match between all of that. And here is a website we have, which gives values of the constants. Uh, you can go and find any of the values that we've evaluated on this. You can search by name. And uh, this one gives the uh, 2018 values. That's the latest adjustment. Uh, we haven't published the paper yet. We're kind of behind on that, but it will come out soon. As I said, we're in proofreading stage. And so, but you can find out previous values if you want to historically check something you calculated a while ago and see what the constants were used, were, that were used in that calculation. You can go back to previous adjustments all the way back to 69. So we have uh, access, give you access to all of these uh, publications and plus some additional information. Uh, that might be of interest. We also give out wallet cards. You can write to NIST and ask for a wallet card, which gives a bunch of constants. And that sometimes people like to have, have that in their pocket. You never know when somebody on the street will stop you and say, you know, what's the electron mass lately? And uh, 
it's too bad I can't hear if anybody's laughing, but uh, I, uh, I, uh, I think that's not going to happen. I mean, that's stopping. I was on. laughing. Good. I mean, stopping on the street's not going to happen. Laughing might happen. Anyway, here's the website for that. It's physics.nist.gov constants. It should be something you, you can remember uh, in case you... And also, you can just Google constants and you'll get it. So uh, anyway, uh, that's, that's uh, a good resource. So here's the previous, most recent published one in 2016. And it's in Reviews of Modern Physics, of course. It's also published in the Journal of Physical and Chemical Reference Data, which is more geared toward chemists. And they have, so it reaches a broader audience. Uh, Reviews of Modern Physics is, of course, mostly physicists. And the other journal is mostly chemists, but we publish exact same paper in both places. They're very uh, tolerant of us to be able to do that. Uh, this publication in 2018, there are two publications uh, which are called 2017 values. And that was a very, a special adjustment. Normally we had adjustments on uh, 2004, 2004, sorry, 2014, 2018, and 2000, uh, 2000, every four years, but this is 17 and it was out of sync. And the reason we did that was because the new SI was going to be defined in terms of values of these constants, H, E, K, and N, A. And so the people who chose the values for the SI wanted to have the best values. So they asked us to make a special adjustment just to get the current best values. And those are the values that were used to define the new SI. So those were two special publications, but the rest of the time they come out every four years. Here's 2014, 2018, and the next one will be 2022. And that means that the data up to the end of 2018 was used to do it. And uh, we put it on the web soon after. In fact, we put it simultaneous with the redefinition of the SI, which came in 2019, just as because we do the new SI uh, values of these constants rather than the old SI values. And so there's a big change in the accuracy between 2014 and 2018. So how are precise values determined? And that's, uh, uh, I think of interest, for example, one of the most accurate constants is the Rydberg constant two parts and 10 to the 12. And the way that's determined is through hydrogen and deuterium spectroscopy. Um, it's also done through muonic hydrogen, which is a way of measuring the proton radius because that's one of the things among these dots here is additional small corrections. And one of them is the size of the proton. So that information also goes in here as well as the fine structure constant and other mass ratios and that sort of thing. But this is the main contribution. And this, uh, all of the rest is small corrections. So if you take a transition and the most accurately measured one is the 1s, 2s in hydrogen and plug into this formula and put in all the rest of this, you'll get back a value for the Rydberg constant because that's an unknown in this. So that's how you get the Rydberg constant just by comparison, comparing frequencies and uh, theory. Another accurate value is obtained for the atomic mass of the electron in relative atomic mass of the electron, which means the mass in units where carbon has a mass of 12. And again, as I said, that's more accurate uh, than the mass in kilograms because it's easier to compare to a carbon atom than to a kilogram uh, macroscopic mass. And the way this is done, the way you get a value is the following, that there's a spin flip frequency, which is a transition in a magnetic field, uh, an energy level transition in a magnetic field, which is proportional to the G factor of the atom. This is a hydrogen-like atom and carbon is the most uh, accurate one that's being used. And so if you take, uh, it says X because they use more than one, but a carbon is the, the main one. So you have the G factor, which is a theoretical number. You have to calculate that. And that's a very big enterprise for the theorists, keeps them, keeps them busy. Uh, but once you know the G factor, then the frequency, the spin flip frequency is proportional to the B field 
divided by the mass of the electron. And uh, you also have for this hydrogen-like ion, which carbon, it's, it's got, uh, it's Z is six. And so you have a charge of five altogether. This is the cyclotron frequency. It's proportional to EB divided by the mass of the uh, atom. So you have these two numbers. And if you take the ratio, the important thing is the B field cancels out. So you don't have to know what it is. As long as it's uniform, it doesn't, it doesn't really enter in a big way. And you're left with the G factor, which is again, theoretical. And uh, this mass ratio, which is the mass of the nucleus, or I should say of the uh, ion and the mass of the electron. And you can just throw in numerator and denominator uh, divide by the mass of the uh, uh, atomic mass unit. And so you get the mass of the atom measured in atomic mass units. And that's something that people can do. They can measure atoms uh, in uh, a spectrometer and compare it to compare carbon and other atoms. The whole periodic table actually is done. Uh, it's an atomic mass data group project, not us who do that. And you also have the same thing, you divide the numerator and denominator by the mass of the uh, atomic mass unit. And now you have the mass of the electron and atomic mass units here. And so this is measured very accurately in spectrometers. This is calculated theoretically. This is measured in a trap. And again, the B field cancels out. And so you're left with this quantity MX over MU, uh, which in the case of carbon, is 12, that's for the neutral atom is 12. And then you subtract off the mass of the five, of, uh, five electrons from a neutral carbon. And then the, also the binding energy. And when you do all that, you get, you get a very accurate number for this mass ratio. And so that mass ratio goes into this formula and out comes the, uh, the mass of the electron and atomic mass units. So this is how you get the Me over Mu very accurately. Another one that's accurate is the fine structure constant. And that's measured primarily by two different methods. One is, and this is the more traditional method actually, comparison of theory and experiment for the G factor of the electron, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron. Uh, again, this is done in a trap where you compare uh, cyclotron motion for the electron with spin flip uh, frequency. And again, it's proportional to the G factor of the electron this time times the B field and the mass of the electron. And the G factor is, uh, according to the Dirac equation, it's two exactly. But then when you start calculating QED corrections, it's a little different and you get AE uh, theoretically from QED uh, or from the measurement. And, and so if you take the difference between the spin flip frequency and the cyclotron frequency, uh, everything cancels except and then divide by the cyclotron frequency, everything cancels except AE and you're left with an experimentally determined measurement of AE just by comparing this frequency difference to this frequency. And that's, people can do things with frequency very accurately. Almost all of these very precise measurements are frequency based. Now the theory, uh, and this doesn't give you alpha, this just gives you AE. And so the question is, what's that got to do with fine structure constant? And the answer is that uh, the theoretical value for AE has contributions from quantum electrodynamics, from weak interaction theory, from hadron, hadronic contributions, from strong interactions. And these are really very small. It's almost all QED. And the QED is done by calculating Feynman diagrams. Uh, this is the leading term. This is the famous Schwinger term. It's C2 is a half. And that was calculated long, one of the 1947 or 48, one of the first QED calculations. And that has been carried on with more and more diagrams. The number of powers of alpha tells you the number of photons. So this is, this is the basic diagram, which is this one. And that's one photon, one virtual photon. And if you now loop in virtual photons every way you can imagine until you have five of them, uh, and then calculate it, which involves thousands and thousands of di di diagrams, very big calculation, you get a number for AE. 
But the main dependence of AE is this leading term because these are all smaller. Alpha is one over 137. And so each of these gets smaller and the coefficients are not growing especially. And so you get this uh, alpha dependence. Actually, you need at least two terms to get it right. But it's mostly proportional to alpha. And this way you get alpha by comparing, you say, okay, the theory is equal to the experiment. And then you solve for alpha and that gives you the fine structure constant. And that's good to uh, two parts of 2.4 parts in 10 to the uh, 10. And so uh, this number is a little better because there's another measurement, another way to measure it, measure it which is uh, the following. Uh, you can also measure it by doing atom recoil measurements. And that gives you a better value, or I should say a value with a smaller uncertainty. And the idea behind these experiments is if you shine a photon on an atom and it absorbs the photon, it will recoil. And then if it re-emits it back in the same direction, opposite direction, I should say, it, it gives it a factor of two. In fact, there's a factor of two, which comes from that. And, uh, and so, and this has a certain mass. So if you know the mass of the atom, the frequency of absorption and the frequency of emission, which are not the same because the energy goes into the atom, you get the uh, incident energy minus the outgoing energy divided by the incident energy squared. And this is equal, this is proportional to H over M. And this, this equality is just the result of kinematics, nothing more, nothing fancy, just do the, uh, <clears throat> it's a good exercise in, uh, in relativistic kinematics. It's gotta be relativistic because you have E equals MC squared coming in and that sort of thing. But then you do that calculation and, and then you notice that this, is, uh, this used to be a good measurement of H over ME, but now it's a measurement of ME because H is known. But what you need to do is you don't know MX, this would be MX in kilograms. And you don't really know that, but you do know it in atomic mass units. So you put this ratio in here and then this ratio up here. Now we just worked out how you get at this ratio, which is the previous two slides ago, uh, through the uh, hydrogen-like atom uh, spin flip versus cyclotron frequency measurement. And so you know that. And then you also, you also know this because you can do very accurate measurements of masses of atoms compared to the mass of carbon because they're all on the same scale of size. And people do mass spectrometry, which, uh, which creates a very vast table of atom values in atomic mass units. And, uh, that, and then there's a factor of H over M. So the question is, what do you do with H over M? Well, if you go to the Rydberg constant, which is over here, <clears throat> you'll see there's a H over M in there, plus things that are very well known. For example, the Rydberg constant we already talked about is very well known. Fine structure constant is very well known. C is exact, H is exact. And so you get H over M, which you can then stick into this formula uh, in terms of other constants. So you're left with uh, very accurately known things like parts in 10 to the 11 here and here, parts in 10 to the 12 here. And then the biggest uncertainty comes from alpha. So by measuring this and comparing it to this formula, you get a value for alpha. And the alpha uncertainty is actually half of the uncertainty in the measurements because you to square and that doubles the uncertainty. And so you get a value with about two parts in 10 to the 10 for the fine structure constant. And uh, the numbers with the two different methods, I mean, the previous method and this method are not exactly the same, but they're good enough that you know, you know it's not uh, completely wrong. But there's room for question about whether they will agree as they get accurate. These things get more and more accurate as time goes by in general. So we'll, the future will tell us how that works out. The thing about this is it's totally different. Think about this. The one thing comes from these exotic QED calculations. And this is the thing that amazes me personally, that you can do this incredibly difficult calculation and you get a number out by comparing theory and experiment. And then you do a completely different experiment where you just, there's no theory virtually, there's only kinematics in this formula. And you get out a number 
which agrees to 10 significant figures. I think that's just amazing how that can happen. But it happens. So let's get on with the uh, redefinition motivation. Why should anybody want to change the SI units? And uh, there are various reasons. The, the most important depends on uh, your personal perspective. The kilogram was unstable. And I'll give you more detail about that. The conventional electrical, conventional electrical units were not actual SI units. And uh, I'll talk about that more also. Kelvin was based on isotope dependent triple point of water, the definition of temperature, that it's a certain temperature when it's, when it's a triple point of water is uh, kind of isolated. It's only at that temperature that you get a definition. You can't scale it to higher or lower temperatures. And that's the next point. The new definitions are scalable. You can, they will work for kilograms, micrograms, or tons, or whatever measure thing you need to measure. The, the definitions can stay the same. Uh, and there are ways to make measurements at different scales, which will be uh, almost as accurate as they would be at the kilogram scale. In fact, I think the kilogram is not the ideal scale. A little bit smaller masses are easier to measure. And if you do this def redefinition, the fundamental constants have smaller uncertainties. And that's uh, actually a pretty big effect. And we'll see all of that coming up. So here's the kilogram. This is a picture of the uh, kilogram. There's one international prototype, the kilogram. And then there are copies, six copies. And these are kept in a vault in the basement of the BIPM building in uh, Sev, France, which is just outside of Paris. And there are like uh, two or three keys, which different uh, dignitaries have to use to get in and uh, uh, look at it. And I think every year there's a committee that goes down, it's in a basement and they go down there, they open the door and they say, yes, it's still there. And then they close the door and that's it for another year. But here's the problem, when they take them out, which doesn't happen often, here they started, they started making them in the late 1800s. And they took them out in 1946 and measured them. And, and turns out they're not all the same. In other words, these graphs show relative to the, <coughs> excuse me, relative to the main kilogram, what the masses are. And they've changed by maybe 25 to 50 parts in 10 to the Eight, nine, I think this is, this is five, five parts in 10 to the eight. And it's changed by that much. And that happened again in 19, oh, it's still not working. Okay. That happened again in 1989 uh, or 90. And they were still, there was a trend that they were still deviating. And so this meant that the kilogram itself was changing or they were all changing. You couldn't tell because it's just relative measurements. You had no absolute standard for mass. And this was not considered a good idea. And to make matters worse, you not only had to take out the kilogram and compare them, you had to wash it before you compared it because air would, it would be absorbed. And so it would get heavier. And so you had to wash off the absorbed, whatever it is. And there was a prescription for doing that. And this is what you get. Here's the kilogram main kilogram after one washing and after two washings. And uh, you can see it's changed by six parts in 10 to the eight, which is pretty big. Uh, these are micrograms, which are uh, out of a kilogram, that's 10 to the uh, nine. So this is 60 parts in 10 to the nine, which is six parts in 10 to the eight. And of course, if you're a theorist, you wonder if this series will converge and, uh, or will it just go to nothing after a while? And uh, of course, nobody asked that question, except uh, theorists like, like me. And, uh, but uh, it is a bad sign that it changes when you wash it and uh, makes it a little less reliable. So this is motivation that the kilogram itself is really not a great standard to have. Not only that, you had to go to France to measure. If you have something and you want to know if it's a kilogram, you have to go to France and uh, compare it. And that's uh, not ideal either. So the idea was to redefine the SI and 
make these constants exact. And this is just to remind you what they are. Um, and I'll go through them one by one and try to answer why knowing these constants tells you uh, about measurement standards. Well, the, the time is easy because it's a frequency. And that's, uh, yeah, I mean, you can clock off a second, like I said, by actually counting cycles, but it's really frequencies that people compare to each other. And that's, uh, this is the standard frequency. It's not ideal because it's microwave. And now they have optical standards, which are much more accurate. However, it's very hard to agree on what should be the next standard for the second. And that's something that will work in progress where people are trying to come up with very good atomic clocks and have very free, very stable frequency standards. And uh, cesium is still doing well, but it's not ideal again, because it's such a long wavelength compared to optical transitions. So the Hertz, if it's, you know, many Hertz higher, then it's easier to, uh, it's a finer tooth comb. Speed of light in vacuum is that number. Okay, that's one of the definition terms in the new SI. Uh, this really hasn't changed, as I mentioned. In the previous SI, the meter was defined as the distance traveled by light in some fraction of a second, which was just one over this, of course. And, uh, uh, and so that would tell you what a meter is, although I know it's really hard to measure distance by saying with a stop watch and uh, you know, light and say, how long did it take the light go from one end of the meter to the other? That wouldn't work very well. It's really done with, uh, uh, with uh, optical cavities. The new SI is just says what the speed of light is, which is equivalent. I mean, you can always turn it around. It's just a different way of phrasing it so that everything would be consistent. Um, but also it's consistent with the fact that you actually measure wavelengths uh, of light. That's really how you measure uh, accurate lengths. And uh, that depends on the frequency, which is based on the cesium clock and C, which is exact. And so that gives you a meter or a fraction of a meter. Now, the, the, uh, the mass and the kilogram uh, are more, uh, and the Planck constant is a little more subtle. So I have to go a little digression for this. You, there are two ways to, there are two things that need to be measured for this uh, whole process. And that is voltage and resistance. Voltage is measured with the Josephson effect where, uh, you, uh, you have a, uh, two, sep two superconductors and you have an uh, insulator in between them and it put light of a certain frequency on and the current will flow when the frequency has a certain quantized value. And the uh, quantum Hall effect is just a quantum version of the Hall effect where a current going and a flat metal plate will produce a voltage across it uh, if it's in a magnetic field because of the electrons being pushed to one side. So this is, uh, these are two things that are used to measure resistance and voltage very precisely. And this is something which uh, has been around for a while. And uh, Josephson effect, again, I already said this, but the important thing is that there's this Josephson's constant. In other words, you have a voltage proportional to the frequency, and then there's a coefficient, a constant based on the theoretical uh, based on theory, which is actually not very complicated. This is much more complicated theory, but this is not. And, uh, uh, and so you get this relation and it depends on KJ. This is the Josephson constant. Similarly, the quantum Hall effect, von Klitzing discovered this and uh, you get a Hall voltage across a conductor. And again, it's quantized in such a way that there's a proportionality constant RK von Klitzing constant which is the resistance or the voltage across the whole device divided by the current going through it. So this is the resistance you get and it's quantized. And so this is a very accurate way to measure voltage and resistance. And so that's a precursor to defining how to measure the kilogram. So there's uh, what's uh, another piece of information so the question is, what's this got to do with the constants? Well, the Planck constant is now defined exactly. 
The elementary charge is now defined exactly according to the new SI. What that means is that the Josephson constant, which is 2e over h, this e and this, uh, sorry, this e and this h, uh, is now exact. And the von Klitzing constant is now exact uh, because it's h over e squared by coincidence. It just involves these two constants. And the, uh, the thing that happened, and I said that the uh, electrical measurements were not SI previously, was that people said, okay, let's just say this has a certain number, which is close to the actual number. And the same for this, and we'll make all measurements in terms of those hypothetical values of the two constants. And those were called, that was done in 1990. And from 1990 until 2018, that was the standard for voltage and resistance measurements was the defined values of these constants, but they had nothing to do with E and H. I mean, they were close, but they were not exactly E over H. They were just made up numbers. And so that was a defect of electrical measurements. They were not really SI units. So what about the plot constant? Um, how does that enter in? Well, you can use the plot constant to determine mass in the following way. It's there are, well, there are two ways. There's an electromagnetic scale called the watt balance or Kibble balance after its inventor, or there's the way of creating a silicon sphere of a known mass. And you can, if, if you create a silicon sphere of a known mass, then you have a standard of mass, or if you have a watt balance, you can actually weigh something and see if it's uh, a kilogram. Of course, so you're measuring the force of gravity, but you can also measure uh, the acceleration of gravity very accurately. That's not a problem. So here's how the watt balance worked or the Kibble balance works. It takes two things, and this is much like all the other experiments where you have to do two things to eliminate the magnetic field, which you don't know that well. So what you do is you have a radio magnetic field pointing outward in all directions in a plane, and you move a coil, you are, sorry, you put a current in this coil so that it exactly balances a kilogram, which is sitting here. So you put a kilogram on here and then you turn up the current until it matches, uh, the force matches the force of gravity on the kilogram. And so that's one measurement. The problem is that depends on the magnetic field. And so here's an equation. You get the MG, which is the force, involves a voltage, uh, that you voltage over resistance, which is the current in the loop. And it also involves the magnetic field times the length of the wire in the loop, which you also don't know that well. And then there's G, which you, acceleration of gravity, which is something you can measure accurately. So that's one mode, but the problem is you don't know the B field that well. So you go to this other mode where you have a, a velocity drive, which makes this move at a steady rate through the magnetic field. And when it does that, it creates an EMF on the current loop. And that EMF is proportional to the velocity, which you can measure accurately with laser interferometry, the magnetic field and the length of the wire. And again, there's the length of the wire times the magnetic field. So they both have this. And if you take the ratio of these, you can eliminate the length of wire times B. It's not just the length, it's the whole configuration, but this is just a schematic. And if you do that, you get uh, an expression which depends on, you get the mass in terms of various constants associated with the measurements of the Hall effect and the, uh, the uh, quantum Hall effect and the uh, Josephson effect, like frequencies that are in the, in the Josephson effect and step numbers from the quantum Hall effect, the velocity of motion, acceleration of gravity and H. So the mass is proportional to H and so the thing is, all of this other stuff is well known. And, uh, and if you then have, this gives you the mass in terms of H and these quantities. And I, I, there, I've done a little math here just to show you that the thing that's relevant is V1, V2 over the resistance. This is two Josephson voltage measurements and this is a quantum Hall measurement. And it involves these constants, 2e over h squared and 
H over E squared in the R. And if you work it all out, you end up with just H. And so that's why you have only H appearing over here. All of the electrical stuff that's contained in here has turned out to be just H. So if you know H, you know M, or in the old days, if you know M, you could measure H. And so that's what, that's what uh, uh, is used to measure mass now. That's one way. The other way if it's with a silicon sphere. If you take a single crystal, this is a single crystal of silicon, 28, very highly enriched isotopically. Then you can, which you can, you can measure the atomic mass of silicon by maybe in principle by photon recoil, you get H over M and you know H, you get M. And the number of atoms determined by lattice spacing, which you can measure by interferometry, X-ray interferometry, and you can measure the volume. So you know the distance between the atoms, you know the volume of the cube, the sphere, and you can then calculate how many atoms there are. And so you have the number of atoms times the mass of each gives you the mass of the sphere. So that's a way of creating a sphere of known mass. And it has its own problems because you have surface effects and things of that sort. And what you've done in the end is you've created another kilogram in some sense. You've got this artifact just like you had before. Whereas if you do the watt balance, you can just weigh any mass you want to. You don't have to compare it to a standard. And you can build the watt balance anywhere in the world, whereas these things are just where they've been made. And so, uh, of course, you can make a lot of them, but still, it's not. Uh, the watt balance is kind of the preferred method at the moment. And so here was the result of this 2017 adjustment. At the time of the adjustment, we had all of these different measurements. These are watt balance measurements, kibble balance measurement, uh, X-ray crystal density, that means the uh, silicon sphere, the uh, Avogadro project, which is another silicon sphere measurement, and this is the kibble balance. So we had a bunch of different ways of measuring H. And so in the end, we put them all together and we got this recommended value, which is, uh, looks maybe too good to be true compared to the data, but it is the average. And, uh, uh, and that's the value that was used to define the kilogram. In other words, it was taken to be very close to that value as what would be the kilogram, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Planck constant from then on. So these are the Planck constants that were measured. And this is the value that was recommended and that became, uh, the uncertainties went away, it became the exact value. What about the Avogadro constant? Well, uh, this is kind of redundant because there's a formula that relates the Avogadro constant times the Planck constant is equal to something which is very accurate. And so if you know one, you know the other. I mean, this is the thing that will turn up in the uh, silicon sphere experiment. But <coughs> like I said, if you know one, you know the other. And so they're, they're kind of equivalent. Uh, however, here's what's interesting. The Avogadro constant is the number of atoms in a mole. That's the uh, new definition. It tells you, if you know the Avogadro constant, which you do because it's given to you, then you know the number of atoms in a mole. Now in the old SI, a mole was as many entities as there are in carbon 12 as there are in 12 grams of carbon 12. Now that's sort of like a trick uh, definition because it doesn't tell you how many atoms are in the mole. It tells you how you could possibly, uh, you can compare uh, a certain number. Of, uh, you'd have to find a way to compare the number of atoms uh, based on the mass. And that's, that's kind of not as useful as just knowing the number because now you can actually you can actually uh, work on the number by doing the uh, silicon sphere experiment. So it's an improved definition and it's a different definition. The problem is you can't say, you can't use this definition because it's inconsistent with the watt balance way of determining the Planck constant. So the defin this definition had to change in order not to have an overdetermined system of, uh, of units of mass. The Boltzmann constant, if you fix K, you fix uh, the temperature scale, the relation between energy, free energy and temperature. And that is, uh, and here I have a list of ways of measuring temperature. And this is constant volume gas thermometry. Here's KT, acoustic gas thermometry. 
here's KT. Everywhere you see noise thermometry, KT. Everywhere you look, there's a KT. And so that's the thing you're measuring. That's really the energy. And so that's the thing that temperature measurements determine is the free energy. And so to convert that to a temperature, you need the Kelvin. But like I said, there's not really physics content in that. It's just converting from energy to temperature, which is in some sense an arbitrary choice. Here's a, a bunch of experiments which were made running up to the uh, redefinition. And here's the value that was the average and selected as the one that would determine the Kelvin. And so that was uh, chosen. And this one was unchanged uh, for light intensity. So now what, ha what happened? Uh, what is the uh, impact of this? Well, first of all, you get some exact constants, H, E, K, and N, A. They're all, they have no, these are the uncertainties in parts of 10 to the nine. Now they had uncertainties. The Boltzmann constant had the most, and now they're none. And so there's no uncertainty in those constants. But it turns out that the Josephson constant, which is just combinations of E and H, and the von Klitzing, also E and H, also have no uncertainty. So electrical measurements are now in the SI and they're more precise in terms of SI units. And so that's, that's a big step forward. Molar gas constant is just K times Avogadro. It's just the product of these two, so that's exact. Faraday constant is electric charge times Na, which is now exact. And the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which I can't remember what that is, is uh, uh, now exact. However, here are three things that are left that are not exact. I mean, they're better, much better, but not exact. And so let's look at those a little more. Electron mass in kilograms, this is. So let's, uh, let's look at those. How do you get that? Well, again, the Rydberg constant, and the Rydberg constant has a theoretical formula. And so you know this by doing spectroscopy as we already uh, reviewed. And then you have this formula which involves the mass of the electron. It involves alpha, which is very well known, not super well. Speed of light, which is exact. H, was it, which is exact. And so you take this, all of these things are known except the mass of the electron. And this is the mass of the electron in kilograms. So you just solve this equation and you get the mass of the electron in kilograms. And that's, that's the way you get it, or the way we get it, I should say. Uh, how about the relative atomic mass unit? That's uh, you, 1 12th the mass of carbon. Well, I, we've already, just in the previous slide, Me in kilograms, and that's known from the result of that formula. And the other experiment where we have a hydrogen-like ion, we get the mass of the electron in atomic mass units. And so if you just, uh, and subtract or multiply and divide by various things, you get the atomic mass unit in kilograms. And that's the way we calculate it. The uh, energy conversions, what happens here? Well, there is no uncertainty in energy conversions. I, at least I picked the ones. There's some that you could have that would have uncertainties, but uh, here again are the defining constants. E equals mc squared. This was uncertain. This had no uncertainty before because it's energy mass relation, which is proportional to c squared, which of course was previously known. So this is this had no uncertainty. Still has no uncertainty. However, joule inverse meter, which uh, involves h, has gone from twelve parts in ten to the nine to none. Uh, e equals h nu. The energy of a photon goes from Again, it's H, 12 parts and 10 to the nine, now none. And this is the Boltzmann constant, which is uh, measured by uh, triple, at the triple point of water. And again, that's kind of a uh, difficult thing to do. And that's reduced to nothing. And the relation between EV and joules, which in the past was really not good because E was not that well known. The charge of the electron was not that well known. And that comes in this formula. And so uh, that is now also has no uncertainty, which is very good because a lot of people use EV and you don't want to have a uh, loss of accuracy just because you used EV. How, well, here's the bad news and it's not so bad. Uh, here are the exact constants, but there are things that were defined exactly, which are no longer defined exactly. The kilogram prototype in, in Paris 
had no uncertainty, it was the kilogram, but now it has an uncertainty uh, because uh, uh, it's, it's no longer, it's, it's what the uncertainty of the Planck constant was at the time of the redefinition. I, I think that's that number. Uh, permeability of free space, permittivity of free space. This is an interesting question. We'll get to that on the next slide. These now have uh, smaller, these have, now have uncertainties. They had no uncertainty, now they have uncertainty. But it's not bad, it's 0.1 part in 10 to the nine. Triple point of water we had no uncertainty, it was exactly a certain temperature by definition. And now it has the uncertainty of the uh, uh, measurement. And the molar mass of carbon, in other words, 12 grams of carbon, uh, 12, sorry, uh, 12 grams of carbon used to be exactly uh, a mole. And uh, the molar mass of carbon was 12, exactly, in other words. And now it's only known to 30.3 parts in 10 to the uh, 10 to the nine, not exactly. So these things have lost, but these are not important things. These are not physical constants. These are like uh, somewhat arbitrary, except these two. Let me, and we can go to the next slide for those two. Uh, uh, the fine structure constant in the SI units is equal to E squared over four pi epsilon zero H bar C. And if you look at this equation, the charge of the electron is zero. I mean, the uncertainty of the charge of the electron is zero. Uncertainty of H is zero. Uh, however, alpha, of course, does not have infinite precision. It, it's uh, determined by experiment. It will never be infinitely, you can't redefine it. And what the result of that is, is that epsilon naught, which previously was exactly defined, is now not exactly defined. It's given a number which derives from the fine structure constant. So as time goes by and alpha gets better, this will get better, but this doesn't really need to be known to high precision. It's not really a useful, uh, really a useful quantity. Uh, in the past, this was exact and this was not exact. E was not exact, but eight epsilon naught was exact. Now E is exact, epsilon naught is not exact. And it's not, it's not a big deal. Uh, one way or the other. They always appear in the same formulas. And so uh, the, the effect is not an improvement or, or a loss, a gain or a loss. So let me just close with uh, a couple of quotes. I mean, Maxwell wanted to obtain standards of length, time and mass based on wavelengths, frequencies, masses, and molecules and things of that sort. And that was very forward looking. I mean, Maxwell was a remarkable guy in many ways. And this was done in the, in the 1870. I mean, in those days, they weren't even sure they had atoms, that atoms existed. And so it was like, I think the big breakthrough was Einstein's Brownian motion experiment. And before that, it was not 100% believed that there were molecules and atoms, but he was ready to define constants based on that. However, Planck was one step ahead he said, well, we have these constants, H and K, and, uh, and these would provide a system of units for length, time, mass, and temperature, uh, which are independent of materials, dependent, not dependent on atoms. And you could even, in principle, communicate this to other civilizations, and they'd be able to reproduce our, our standards. And so this was uh, very forward-looking, and it's now finally, you could say, finally been realized. Uh, in the new SI. So thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks, Peter.